Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. It's a very cute picture of a baby. I just would like to take a second to tell you that uh, during the course of my presentation, I will be sharing some intraoperative pictures that might be a little uh, sensitive, so I just wanted to let the audience know about that. Back when I was in medical school, it was the, the thought of taking care of children that um, made me pursue a career in pediatric surgery. At that point, the boundaries of our specialty were from birth to age 18 or 21. As the field has evolved, the boundaries have shifted. We're now involved in the care of the unborn child. And that field is called fetal medicine. And I stand here very privileged before you to um, represent St. Children's Hospital's Division of Fetal Surgery. So how did fetal medicine come to be? Well, it took the uh, convergence of advances in numerous fields that allowed the technological advances to um, permit us to be able to visualize the uh, fetus, advances in pharmacology that allowed us to understand medications that we could provide to the mother without impacting the fetus, and a huge advance in our understanding of the changes that happen in the pregnant women during the uh, course of their pregnancy, the uh, maternal fetal physiology. And it also took a fundamental shift in our ethical approach to the fetus. If you think about it, in most countries, the fetus has no legal rights. But as a fetal surgeon, we have to confer the same rights that I give to every other one of my patients onto this fetus. And that was a huge shift in medicine, in legal ethics, and also in how governments thought about how this field should advance. Now, as we, um, since um, the field of fetal surgery came to be because of all the advances, primarily in our ability to visualize the developing fetus, I just want to take a minute to talk about the advances in maternal obstetrical ultrasound. So taking lessons learned from observations in nature where bats use ultrasonic frequencies to be able to navigate their surroundings, scientists came up with sonar which is sound navigation and ranging. And the first patent for sonar was actually issued a month after the Titanic had sunk. So one can only imagine how history would have been rewritten if that patent had only been issued a few months earlier. In, um, the, towards the end of the Second World War, sonar and radar were being used extensively by the Allied forces to be able to detect and engage with enemy forces. And the first reported uh, use of uh, medical ultrasound came out in 1940. And this was presented, uh, and a young man in the audience, Ian Donald, was uh, a medical student. He went on to be um, professor of gynecology at the University of Glasgow. And he thought he could use this in the field of gynecology. The first report that he presented was the um, imaging of a woman with an ovarian cyst and he prevented this lady from having unnecessary surgery by vi visualizing the ovarian cyst. He then thought about the pregnant uterus. It's a cystic structure with fluid and a fetus inside. If we can visualize ovarian cysts, why can't we use the same technology to look inside the womb? So finally, after centuries of wondering about the miracle, miracles happening during pregnancy, we finally had a way to look inside the uterus. We had a womb with a view. And in 1983, we began to get higher resolution imaging with fetal MRI. MRI had been around for a while before that, but there were concerns about what was the impact of this energy source imaging uh, technology on the developing fetal tissues. But it's been shown to be safe. In fact, ultrasound energy and the uh, em energy of nucle nuclear magnetic resonance has been shown to be safe to fetal tissues. And those are the only two imaging technologies that we use routinely during uh, pregnancy to visualize the fetus. So this is a uh, fetal ultrasound. And uh, on the uh, right-hand side of the screen, you will see the uh, small fluid-filled balloon-like structures. And those are the cysts that have replaced the normal tissue of the kidney on the right side. Towards the middle and the upper part of the screen there, you'll see the uh, solid arrowhead with the word left. And that's a, a kidney that's still not totally normal um, but it's much more normal than the right kidney. Now compare these images to the images that we get with a fetal MRI. So the upper row of images there are a fetal MRI. 
And I'd like to draw your attention to the second panel of that upper row. That is a fetus who is um, visualized on his side. He's looking to the left of the screen. The upper part is his brain. The lower balloon-like white structure is the bladder that's obstructed. The next frame over, the fetus is now looking straight out at you. And you can see a, uh, towards the um, left of the screen there, you can see a normal kidney. And the other kidney right next to it is much smaller and being pushed aside by a fluid-filled structure. This is an instance where this fetus has an obstructed bladder. The fluid has backed up into the kidney, leaked out of the kidney, and is pushing that kidney to the side. Now, those same images by ultrasound are in the lower panel. You can see the bladder and the kidneys. And there's really no comparison to the quality of images. But ultrasound is actually good enough for most pregnant uh, ultrasound um, in terms of being able to get information. So we don't recommend a fetal MRI on every single pregnancy. It's complementary to ultrasound once we find a abnormality. Now that we had the ability to look inside the developing fetus, we started to pick up abnormalities. And we now know that um, for every 100 pregnancies, we're going to find one pregnancy that does have a congenital anomaly. And being a pediatric urologist, one third of those abnormalities involve the genital urinary tract. Now, the advances in medical ethics, we had to confer upon the fetus the same rights as any other human being. And also a fundamental shift in how we practice medicine, because for me, the fetus is my patient. But my primary concern about the safety is not for the fetus, it's for the mother, who is not my patient. She's the patient of the obstetrician. That's something that is very foreign to medicine, because your patient is your concern. But here, it's the mom who's my main concern. I have to make sure that whatever I'm doing to treat the fetus doesn't harm the mom. And so there's three cardinal rules that we have in fetal surgery. And the first is that the proposed intervention, when we have an anomaly that we have to treat, the proposed intervention has to have proof that it is going to be a life-saving uh, in intervention to the fetus. And this has to be based on either animal studies or human studies from the past. The second is that of all the available options, that the intervention that you're offering has to be the safest and probably provide the most reliable outcome. And the third is that it has to be shown to have low risk to the mom, low risk to the current pregnancy, and should not impact any future pregnancies. In 2004, three area hospitals came together, Children's Hospital, University Hospital, and Good Samaritan Hospital. And they formed the Fetal Care Center of Cincinnati. Since its inception in 2004, we've had over 3,000 fetal consults. We are one of the busiest fetal centers in the country. And on a daily basis, we're pushing the envelope in terms of making sure we provide the safest, most effective, most ethical care to the expectant couple and their fetus. When we talk about fetal interventions, to me, I think the most important intervention that I provide and my team provides is educating the expectant couple about what's going on with their unborn child. Talking about the diagnosis, making sure they understand that there's nothing that they did that caused this to happen, and there's probably nothing that they could have done to prevent this from happening. Talking about the outcomes of interventions and outcomes without any intervention, so they understand the risk and benefit and what to expect. Once we have decided that we are going to perform an intervention, there's three different types of interventions that we as fetal urologists provide. Now, as a pediatric urologist, one of the most common conditions that we treat in utero is a condition called posterior urethral valves. This is a condition where an embryological remnant at the base of the bladder has persisted, and so now the fetal bladder is obstructed. Why is this important? The kidneys and bladder are usually fully formed by about 12 weeks. And during the remainder of the pregnancy, the amniotic fluid, the source of the amniotic fluid is the fetal urine. And the baby is constantly drinking that fluid. And that fluid, with the bio, uh, biological uh, agents within it, are responsible for the development of the lung. So if there's no amniotic fluid leaving the baby's bladder, there's nothing to allow the lungs to develop. And the failure of the lungs to develop is associated with a high mortality rate. So that's the connection between the bladder, kidneys, and the lungs. The most common intervention that has been performed 
ever since Dr. Harrison started the field of fetal, Euro fetal surgery back in 1983 at the University of uh, California, San Francisco, has been the placement of a shunt. And what they do is, with a large bore needle, they can go right in through the maternal abdomen, the uterus with ultrasound guidance, and place a small plastic tube. One end of the tube is in the fetal bladder, and the other end is outside the baby's body, allowing the urine to drain outside. This allows for repopulation of the amniotic fluid, the baby's now able to swallow that fluid, and the lungs develop. The results in terms of pulmonary or lung development have been very good. Unfortunately, the results on preserving renal function, allowing for a healthy bladder to develop, have not been that good. So what are the theories behind fetal interventions? Well, any intervention we undertake, we're trying to either halt the abnormal process and allow for normal development to occur, or either stabilization of the process so that fetal development can, pr can proceed as it should have. So in this instance, the lungs develop normally, but the bladder and the kidneys may not have any benefit. The next, the next uh, type of intervention is a fetoscopic fetal intervention. And fetoscopic interventions are basically using a very specialized telescope. The uh, scope is less than two millimeters wide in diameter. We're able to pass that scope right through the maternal abdomen, the uterus, and in this instance, to the um, left of your screen there, you can see um, a twin pregnancy where aberrant blood vessels are allowing one twin to grow at the expense of the second twin. So fetoscopically, the fetal surgeons can go in and they can identify the abnormal blood vessels. Using a laser energy, they can coagulate, photocoagulate those vessels and allow the pregnancy and both twins to grow to become healthy. In pediatric urology, we actually pass the scope through the uterus through the baby's abdomen into the bladder, and we can now visualize the obstruction at the base of the bladder. And that's the image to the top there. Those valve leaflets, they're like thin, wet pieces of Kleenex. And it always amazes me that these flimsy things can destroy a fetal life. And using a laser, we can then ablate that tissue, allow for the urine path to come out through its normal, natural, and anatomical pathway through the urethra. The most invasive approach that we take is an open fetal intervention. And in order to be able to perform this, we actually have to partially deliver the fetus. We only undertake these interventions when the option of not intervening will almost certainly result in a fetal demise. So we do this in the worst case scenario because we want to provide the best possible chance to the fetus. When you think about the urinary tract, in addition to allowing flow to occur, also an important factor is at what pressure is that flow occurring at. And thinking back to high school physics, resistance is directly proportional to the length of the tube, inversely proportional to the diameter of the tube. So with the shunt, we have a long, narrow tube, lots of pressure required to pass, that, uh, to pass the urine out. With the fetoscopic procedure, we are limited sometimes in our ability to look into the fetal bladder because of the body habitus of the fetus and also the mother. With open interventions, we're able to create a very large path for the urine to come out, but it comes at a higher risk. So here you see the, the fetus has partially been delivered, and we're making a vesicostomy. And what that is is an opening between the abdominal wall and bladder to allow the urine just to freely flow out. We do use some sutures to ensure that it stays open. And if you look here, that is a big opening in a small fetus. Once we've made the uh, vesicostomy, we gently replace the fetus back into the uterus. We repair the uterus. We close up the mom. The team that it takes to do these surgeries is immense. It takes a fetal cardiologist whose only job is to watch the fetal heart rate while we're doing the surgery to make sure that as we have the baby partially outside of the womb, we're not causing any impairment of the blood flow. We have a, pediat a pediatric uh, anesthesiologist who is working to keep the mother pain-free and sedated, and also to ensure that the baby is not feeling any pain. We have a fetal surgeon, a fetal urologist, and we have a maternal fetal medicine surgeon whose job is to take care of the mom. So it takes a big team to do an operation on a very, very small baby. Once we've done the surgery, the mom is allowed to um, recover in the recovery room and then goes on bed rest for the remainder of the pregnancy. 
And once we've done surgery on a uterus, that uterus can only go for another 10 weeks of pregnancy before we have to deliver the baby. Another thing about the open fetal interventions is that it does require that all future pregnancies are delivered by a C-section. So it comes at a price. But this surgery resulted in this baby being delivered with normal healthy lungs. His right kidney was normal. His left kidney, unfortunately, had already been damaged. Um, so we ended up removing that left kidney. His bladder is totally normal. And I'd like to draw your attention to the size of that vesicostomy. It's very, very small. It was a huge hole that we put on the fetal abdomen, and now it's almost closed off. And that just shows you how well fetus is healed. These scars almost will disappear. This child is now four years old. He's running around like a regular toddler, enjoying life as all children should. And it's very humbling to us to know that without the intervention, this child wouldn't be here today. So ever since Dr. Harrison coined the phrase fetal interventions back in 1983, the field has advanced significantly, but I still think it's in its infancy, and there's a lot of work that we need to do. We need to have functional imaging the MRI and the ultrasound are what we call descriptive imaging. They let us know how things look. They don't really let us know how things are working. Uh, biomarkers of fetal renal function so we can understand if this fetus is going to survive if we make an intervention. Because if the kidneys don't work, it, there's very little point in proceeding with any intervention. And also we need to have randomized clinical trials so we can say, are the interventions that we're undertaking really making a difference? Our mission is to make sure that we have to make sure that any of the interventions that we undertake are protecting the mother's health, ensuring that the fetus gets the best possible care, and maintain the highest standards of scientific and ethical be uh, behavior to allow us to then advance this field further. One of the unique programs that we have at Cincinnati is the previous interventions I showed you only work if the kidneys are still working. There's a point in pregnancy when the obstruction results in irreversible damage to the kidneys. And we have assembled a team where we have included a pediatric nephrologist and pediatric transplant surgeons. We can now intervene in children and fetuses who have no functioning kidneys, allow their lungs to develop. Once they're delivered, we can start dialysis in the newborn period. And once we get to around age two, these children can get a transplant from one of their parents. So we're now making a bigger difference. We're still very early on in this very unique program. We've had 13 fetuses go through the program, and we have had four of them that have made it to age two and had their transplants done. The rest of them are still in the growing phase. So I think that we have to continue to study the fetal interventions and the impact of the interventions on the mom, on the family unit, because it can be very stressful emotionally, psychologically, and also financially to have a very chronically ill child. We have to understand that uh, this is a, uh, a field that has to move ahead with caution because some of the interventions that we undertake do come at a high price to the family and to society and the healthcare system as a whole. But I believe that if we do this properly, that it is, has the promise to make a difference in the lives of many, many children who are born with a congenital anomaly. So thank you very much.